Five, four, three, two, one. Thunderbirds are go. Hey, Jim. Hey, thanks for throwing that in. Like, I wasn't sure we were going to get it on the video. <laughs> I think we could actually, we could actually probably plumb in the actual video, you know, of uh, the Thunderbirds, you know, with the five. We should lap. think about that as we, as yeah. we continually upgrade our, uh, our production capability. I think Gary side. Anderson is actually deceased at this point. So we may have to deal with his, you know, his copyright holders in terms of using the, uh, you know. It's not like Maybe Winnie some... the Pooh. It's not. It's not copyright. Yeah, you know, it's not like the original Steamboat Willie and Winnie the Pooh, which are both open source at this point. So you can do whatever you want with them. Well, maybe we can use those. Okay, or we can wait like thirty more years for the uh, the puppet videos to be open sourced. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 also, as also referenced in that thing you do, Tom Hanks movie, they're not puppets; they're marionettes. Yeah. I'm glad we <laughs> hit the most important part of the conversation early today. <laughs> uh, Let's talk about a topic that we've been talking about a little bit, which is, uh, it's a topic, it's a term, value creation in private equity. Because the idea behind it, it's my day job and it's your day job, but there's also a stigma attached to that word. And when people say it, I think it means a lot of different things depending on who it's coming from. And that idea of what value creation is, where it comes from, the different ways that you get there, and maybe most importantly, Parker Gale's take on how to do it well. That's what we figured was worth talking about today. Yeah, totally agree. Super overused phrase. Um, it's got all sorts of negative connotations. I totally agree with you. Uh, and that was kind of the first uh, page that we wanted to show is quotes yeah. are around it intentionally, <laughs> but... You know, if we had an audience poll on today's conversation, which we don't, uh, <laughs> the, the first thing I might do is throw it out to the audience and say, what, uh, what comes to mind when these words are on the page? So given you're the only audience member here, Jim, but also a participant, like, what does this make you think of? What's the association? What's the, I don't know, what comes into so, your well, head yeah, when so, these words are on the page? I, I would say it's, it's been, it's been, a, it, it's been hanging around the hoop for, you know, or gotten popped in the last number of years in general with PE people who have added operating uh, operators to the team. But in the interest rate rising, you know, world we live in, or risen, uh, interest rate risen world we live in, value creation has taken on, it's become, again, much more popular that, well, now private equity guys really have to put, roll their sleeves up, put the shoulder to the wheel and create value with their portfolio companies, right? It wasn't just buy a company, use a lot of debt, you know, if your rate of return is above the, you know, the cost of your debt, you know, and the thing is growing, you're probably making money, right? But, you know, why, to me, why this is such a, uh, you know, uh, a red herring, uh, uh, red flag in front of a bull, you know, uh, what's, you know, what's making the bull angry here? Uh, it's, it's, it's so, uh, I don't know, so condescending to the companies like, oh, these private equity guys roll in, hey, Create some value. So our, our standard, would you agree, our standard snarky remark at this is, have you considered raising prices? You know, Totally. Um, <laughs> totally. And it, I, I think you're right. It's it, part of the problem and part of the negative stigma around the word is how it's delivered and how it's framed and who it comes from. Because when it's talked about, <laughs> yes. this, this is oh, often the way that it's talked yeah. about. It's this, this holy tome that's immutable there's one way to do it. It's proprietary. Everybody says they have a value creation playbook, right? But nobody really gets into the details of what's inside it, how it works, why this is so much better than what the management team is already working on. And I think half the problem with the term is just how it's framed, which is what we wanted to capture on this page here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it does have the little, like, you know, yeah, congregants, please open your book to Buffett's, you know, <laughs> 13, you know, verse 12 to 7, you know, have you considered raising prices? Yeah, so I, I think that's what I think definitely drives us crazy is the, that it's taken on this mythic proportions that, you know, some outsiders who are now own your company are sitting on the board with their, you know, plethora of experience, you know, uh, mostly outside of your market, probably can come in and just create value by, you know, showing up and making suggestions, right. And I think 
Yeah, it's, I don't think the people who started using that phrase intended it to be that way, but it's sort of become that. Um, and particularly in the, you know, uh, we have seen over the, over our lifetime of Parker Gale, there's been a, a, a stronger interest in adding operating people to, you know, private equity teams for, for multiple reasons. Um, you know, at the, at the very highest level, you know, you're taking your management fees and if you're just, you know, lining your pockets with management fees, you know, not doing anything to really lean in and try and work with your companies, you know, as an investor, I don't know, that you know, probably puts a bad taste in your mouth or leaves a bad taste in your mouth. So, but, you know, part of it is, hey, let's, you know, for the management food we get, sh should we be spending this on the portfolio companies? And this is a little bit of, you know, kind of our, our worldview of private equity. Um, you know, as Devin says, you know, private equity, how to get rich slowly, you know, um, <laughs> which is pretty true. And, and it's absolutely true. Many, many, many of our portfolio company executives have weighed way more, way more money than, than anybody on the PG team. And that's, that's a great thing. And the employees have as well. But this, this idea that, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're not, you know, putting some of the dollars, not using some of what we make uh, to make the portfolio companies better. And, you know, we should make our money if the companies make money, not, you know, not basically just lining your pockets in a piece. So I, that's where I think came from. It just, it just got a little too, you know, got a little too high level. Right. And we've talked about this before that, you know, it, it, way back when, you know, sounds like we're so old now, but the theory of having operating people um, in a private equity firm was typically a lot of ex executives that may be operating partner, but really more operating executive, executive residents sitting around at the PE company, you know, getting a little salary, maybe charging to do some work at portfolio companies, kind of waiting around for the next deal, or maybe to take over from a CEO that, you know, yep. that's already running one of the companies that you have some suspicions about. And, and that's not how we, we looked at it. You know, I think the modern view of the, of the, the operating team are people who are specialists in certain areas that might be critical to the businesses that you buy that are part of the team, right? That are tightly integrated with the deal team and tightly integrated with the portfolio companies. So, um, you know, I think everybody understands that concept. The problem is then translating that down to what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis with these portfolio companies? You know, <laughs> is where some of this ridiculousness started with, you know, the high level suggestions, you know, you should cut costs. You know, have you thought about raising prices? Uh, you know, uh, or whatever the current are you using AI. Have you built a mobile app? Uh, <laughs> as, as we would say, growing up in Boston, you know, the response to that is often, yeah, no doy. Yeah, <laughs> would be the response. Is I'm like, really raising prices? Never thought of that. <laughs> yeah, and and we talked about this at our offsite a few months ago. Like we sat down, and I think initially had the idea that we were going to write down what we thought our playbook was and kind of update the always on elements of what we do to create value yeah. inside the portfolio. And what we came up with was way less this kind of one stop shop tome of answers. And it looked a lot more like what you see on the screen here. But so what are we looking at, Jeff? <laughs> We're looking at the menu from the Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> I know, it gets a lot of, you know, particularly from some members of the pri of the PG team that shall remain nameless that are kind of foodies. Um, would you, you probably slide closer into that camp, but you know, the Cheesecake Factory gets a lot of abuse. But I will tell you, the larger your group of people who don't have a common eating theme, the easier and better it is to go to a cheesecake. Yeah, cake. whatever you're in the mood for, it's, it's mood got for, it, right? They got it, right? Uh, not including changes that you want to make to the menu. So, you know, I, I think what, what we found is the reality is all of the things that you can do or do with portfolio companies, not to with portfolio companies, you know, it's a long list of possibilities, right? And, and I think it's a growing list of possibilities and some things fall off, you know, over time. Some things down. Not everything works for every portfolio company. I mean, we we did a podcast years ago with, uh, with the uh, with a couple of Northwestern professors um, around the roadside MBA was the book, and they talked to small businesses, really small businesses, and you know, applying kind of MBA principles to these a small coffee shop or a diner or you know whatever. And part of part of their mantra was, you know what, it depends. And I think this is where we see the Cheesecake Factory menu. It's sort of it depends, like. What's the state of the business? What are we trying to accomplish? You know, you know the, this big buffet list. This doesn't mean we're going to do hardly any of these things. There could be a hundred things in that. It's not really that big, but you know, 
could be a hundred things on there, but any given portfolio company, maybe you're doing two or three, in, you know, not, but, but this is what you're looking, you're, you're sort of picking from, right? So it's yeah. less of a, less of a um, religious book that thou shalt follow and more of a, hey, it's a, it's a running laundry list of things that we've, we've seen other people use and work, we've tried and worked, or, or even we tried and didn't work and, you know, reminding us that is this something that would really that we can really add value to our companies or we tried this path before right yeah and, and I, I think the the thing that makes this job fun is we have this dual responsibility to build the menu which we'll talk about in a second so set yourself up with the ingredients you know and the implements in the kitchen that you need to totally overdo the culinary metaphor but figure out what you need to order and figure out you know, what the table wants, needs, whatever it is. Um, so I, yeah, the, our answer at our offsite, I think it was the first words on the page was, what's our value creation plan? It, it depends. And I think we've gotten more comfortable with that being both true to our brand as a team, but also I think in keeping with what works well with our company. So what we're gonna do with the rest of this conversation is, is kind of step through the different ways that we think we create value, starting with that idea of the cheesecake factory menu. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I said it before, but one of the fun things about this job is the exploratory part of it and figuring out, okay, within sales and marketing, within products and engineering, within finance, within the more people focused area of the business, what are all the things that you can do? And what are the translations of those projects and consulting engagements and templates and how to guides that are appropriate for a company of one or 200 people, you know, 10, 20, 30 million of revenue. And how do you translate that into the handwriting of each of the situations? So maybe we could just talk about like some of the things that we think are important that are on our menu of offerings. Um, Cause I do think it paints the picture of, Hey, we've got a lot of this stuff on the shelf, but, there are situations where we use 80% of it in a, in a individual company. And there are situations where we might just lean on one or two uh, pieces of the menu. Yeah. Now I think, I think we, we've, we've laid out, you know, how our portfolio works. So and these four bullets in general, you know, we buy founder owned software businesses that are kind of sub 20 million in revenue. Right. So if you look at the categories, you know, sales and marketing, we have found there's lots of complexities in all these businesses, but the places where, you know, leaning in with the teams and, you know, and making decisions and, you know, trying to quote unquote add value falls in the kind of these buckets, right? Sales and marketing, product and engineering, you know, finance and, and M&A, you know, tucking acquisitions and, and people and talent. Those are the buckets for us, given how our portfolio is. So we're kind of, you know, following the, well, the Cambridge model, we're a smaller focus fund, right? Now, if you're a giant fund, you know, $10 billion fund buying manufacturers and healthcare companies and consumer packaged goods, and you know, this list could be much bigger in terms of raw categories for sure, right? Um, and you probably have a much bigger operating team if, if you're doing that. And, you know, for example, maybe you're like us, maybe you're a smaller focus firm, you're only buying manufacturers. And let's say that, there, I'll make a slight change to this. You're buying manufacturing companies that are kind of a hundred million in revenue, right? Well, I would say ERP implementation, supply chain, you know, management, uh, you know, expertise is probably much more important than quote unquote product and engineering because we, we're talking about engineering in terms of software engineering, uh, yep. then, yeah, then that bullet item. And I would say what you do on the people and talent side, you know, could be a much bigger job because you know, a hundred million dollar manufacturing company going to have a lot more employees than a sub $20 million software company, right? So, you know, these are our buckets, but I think you'll find, or you should find the buckets for your particular private equity firm are going to vary by the kind of deals that they do, right? Is yeah. And I'd say we optimize our menu for the things that we end up doing again and again and again. Yes. Uh, and, and like we said, every company is different, but when I look back at the last 12 to 24 months of the job, and I think about the projects that we did and the things that seem to make a difference within sales and marketing, uh, for example, what do we do? We help the companies build a better sales narrative and pitch deck. So when they're in front of a customer, they're making the most of that first impression. We're training the sales team on how to do discovery, how to handle objections, how to give a demo. Um, 
we're talking to customers and figuring out the different use cases and angles that we should use in our marketing messaging. We're doing segmentation on the customer base to figure out where we just win more often. It's all the, the basic who to call, what to say, how to make it your own stuff. But the sequencing of that might be quite different given what the company has already done, given what they're ready for, given what else is going on inside of the organization. But the point is when the time comes and the CRO raises their hand and says, hey, do you have any better sales pitch materials we could steal from and repopulate? Because I've noticed that's a hole in what we've got. Um, if I'm doing my job right, I've got four or five examples from other companies that we've either helped build or that just seem to really work well in the market that we can share with that person and help them get off to a running start. Yeah, and, 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 that, and that is basically just the running start. You know, a pitch deck for one company is going to work for the next company, right? And I would also tell you, by the way, you know, following on your example, uh, if I'm doing the Zach Kinto in uh, Margin Call. Uh, oh, please do. Up, you know, uh, don't exactly agree with your metaphor, but we're using your metaphor. Uh, the, the, I think the other piece here is, you know, a better pitch deck is not something that's a mystery to any of the portfolio companies, right? Oftentimes they're doing a million things and they know about it, but they've never sort of got to it, right? So part of it is just us putting a focus on, hey, we have found that, that adds a fair amount of value it may not have been a high priority for you, but and if we can kind of kickstart it for you, it helps getting you in the in the right direction, right? Um, and I'll give you a I'm going to give you a fictitious example because we've never really run into this, but theoretically you could run into it, right? Can't um, wait. You can have a top of funnel that's so big, you're not realizing you're losing, you know, you're losing eighty percent of the deals to your competitor because because it's a hot market and the top of the funnel is so big, you're still winning. You don't actually know you may be running into a problem at some point because it's been covered by the funnel. Now, I would tell right. you in general, we found that top of funnel isn't- <laughs> That's usually not the problem in our world, but, yep. But yeah, it, it's a, it depends. So, in, you know, in each of these categories, um, you know, there's some you know, there's some clear, like I would argue that finance, M&A, people and talent are probably gonna be categories that apply to every private equity firm working with every portfolio company. But the amount of effort or the amount of focus you put on those are, is going to vary by the size of company, by the size of, and we've learned this lesson ourselves. I think we did a lot of people in talent programs, all of which are good. Some of, some of the, the, the work that we did was just too big for our size companies. Like they, yep. were, really, they were really good programs, but you know, in retrospect, we, we had trouble basically rolling them out given the size companies that we have. Yeah. So, and that's a good point. Cause I, I think the menu, the menu gets better the more stuff you're willing to try and the more yeah. stuff you're willing to reflect on. And if you're willing to call balls and strikes and say, that was worth doing, but now we know that it's either really unique or maybe not that useful at our age and stage of company, that helps because we know, you know, we shouldn't, you know, ask the kitchen to go cook that up again to get back to the uh, the culinary metaphor. So yeah, we're going we're to talk more about that, for, you know, in the category of risk in a, in a few minutes. But but yeah, you're absolutely right. That's you know part of I would look at all of these things. You know, there's probably 10 or 15 bullets under each of these categories. And we've tried some things that just first of all, it just didn't work. They just weren't good, you know along with the portfolio companies, it, you know, we realize hey, it's not really helpful. Some cases where, yeah, this was helpful, but not helpful enough, given the amount of effort that we put into it, just didn't move the needle that much. You know, and some things that were, you know, that we didn't expect to be super valuable that were, were valuable. So part of this is, you know, taking the cheesecake menu and turning it into something that, um, you know, is, there's a lot of possibilities, but you got a smaller number of stuff that you're probably going to have as a go-to. Totally. Right. And, and I'll also say, um, I think, tell me if you agree with this, if you ask our portfolio executives, especially non-CEO portfolio executives, I think you hit it well. Like there's a lot of stuff that they know makes sense, but as they're getting ramped up, as they're running the business, they just don't have time to get to. This is one of the more helpful areas where we can pitch in. Giving yeah. someone a template, giving someone an example, giving someone you know, something else from a portfolio company that can, that can get them 40% of the way there so they don't have to start from scratch. So there's that great Dave Kellogg quote, help is defined in the mind of the recipient. What creates the most value and what's the most helpful to the management team? Those aren't always the same things. But when yeah. you ask the folks that work with and for us where we've helped the most, a lot of times it's just giving them somewhere to start. Yep. 
For so sure. you hit the risk mitigation thing just a minute ago. Let's talk about that one because you've got a good dichotomy here between how to think about macro risks and how to think about micro risks. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, yeah, so now we're, we're diving into what we found is broad categories. So these are not specific things that you're not going to get a list of try raising prices, try cutting costs. Like, you know, again, you know, we, we got broad categories and things fall into this, right? And, and we see mitigating risk uh, uh, and we're coming into this as part of the deal team. So ideally, when you're doing diligence, you know, diligence, you know, should not for operating people is not um, particularly about trying to cut the price you're trying to pay or trying to walk away from the deal. Although there, you know, we may find things that you know tell us that that's what we need to do. It's you know identifying buckets of risk that we should deal with you know early on in our investment cycle. And if yep. you look at anything that we're doing when we engage with portfolio companies the starting point is always mitigating risk. So stuff we found in diligence is like, well, this could be a problem, right? So, you know, and we divide it into to macro and micro, right? On the macro level, we're talking about on my area, we'll talk about this different from a sales and marketing, but in, you know, in engineering, it's, you know, things like technical change that's, that's coming. So, you know, there, at one point, everybody moved from client server to browser and then browser to mobile. And, you know, everybody's sort of looking at AI and, you know, how is that going to affect their products? And so, you know, bringing that in so we're not caught flat-footed is one of the things we do. And again, this is often not a surprise. You know, this is not, it's not like I'm going to walk into one of our portfolio companies and say, hey, have you ever heard of AI? Yeah, of course they have, right? What they're hoping from us is that we've been able to, we're not stuck in one company. We've been able to, you know, look across portfolio companies in the market and say, hey, here's some trends we're seeing that we ought to think about this, right? Is is this going to disenfranchise your product to some degree? Um, you know, sometimes it's, um yeah, the market itself. So end markets are being affected. You know, uh, you know, we just got through. Uh, you know, COVID is the great example of uh, now. COVID is a you know, who could have predicted that? You know, Nostradamus, right? But there are things you can predict in terms of you start to see interest rates climbing up, or inflation, or tax, or you know, we're you know currently look what's going on in you know with uh, China's economy. You know, could have an effect on portfolio companies that are selling into China or manufacturing in China or you know, using offshore resources. And so, you know, having a, a higher level view of, hey, are there any other outside forces here that are going to kick us in the teeth is important, right? Um, you know, that's key. On the micro side, it's very specific to the portfolio company. So one of the things we see on the engineering side is we have oftentimes have single points of failure with people. So, you know, the founders built a good team. They got a lot of loyal people and, you know, Folks may be, you know, doing way more than, you know, uh, than they, they should be doing or need to be doing or took too much on. And so you find yourself in a situation where you got like the one, one person, Sue or Fred, you know, they're the only person that knows how to compile this thing or deploy this thing, right? So we run into the problem of, you know, we like to use the example of win the lottery, not hit by a bus. But, you know, that's, that's a key thing for us. Sometimes it's disaster recovery issues like, uh, wow, we don't really have, maybe we have a backup plan, but we've never tested it. I mean, there are literally gobs of things that you find at a micro level and you have to prioritize the risk. What's the likelihood, right? So, you know, this kind of, you know, this is the kind of thing where, um, you know, if you're living in Florida, you worry about hurricanes too, right? But if you're living in Kansas, you're not really worried about hurricanes. You might be worried about tornadoes, but you're not worried about hurricanes, right? So that's right. Well, you know, th this, this is where you, you do have to understand the the level of risk, you know, uh, in single point, you know, level of micro risk is very specific to the portfolio company. And, you know, something may be, you know, a, if it's got a very high potential for damage to the business, but a very, very small chance of happening, I'm not sure that'd be the first thing we'd put in, right? We're kind of looking for those things that would have a material impact on the business and have a higher likelihood of happening, right? And, yeah. and toward that end, you know, you know, part of it is, as you're pointing out here, Part of it is we're documenting the stuff during due diligence. Like, let's make a list of the things that we're like, mm, we think there's a problem here. And, and maybe we didn't get to a solution or even a full discussion about it with the company during the, the diligence process. But, you know, you know, once we once we closed on the deal, it's like, hey, guys, here's the list we found as we go through it. Let's talk through what's the real risk here and how. We're yeah, at least it. we know it's there. No, and your side is a little different, right? For the sales and marketing side, you know. Yeah, and, and I, I think you're, you're getting at the you hit something important, which I think is the, the discussion about risk during diligence and the discussion about risk post diligence are highly related, right? Because we're going to yes. use the things that we find in diligence 
to drive what our plan is and where we focus and what the priorities are and where we agree uh, as a team, like the things that can wait until later. But a lot of the risks that we would surface during diligence, it, they're all in service of asking like, hey, how hard is this going to be uh, to mitigate or to deal with or to get comfortable with? Um, so that last bullet on the left hand side, like don't compete with Stanford kids, that's just slang for if you're going to be a relatively underfunded competitor in a really hot market with a lot of venture capital funding where people are willing to lose money for years and years to take market share away from you. That's something we got to talk about because that's not typically an environment that we like to exist in because we're not going to outspend right. Anderson Horowitz and Sequoia and all these other guys. Right. So, well, and that, and that, by the way, is, you know, that's probably crossing the line into during diligence. That's, that could be a situation where, and should be a situation where you might be saying that's a reason not to do the deal. Right. hundred percent. Yeah. And I would, and I would argue that you shouldn't have gotten to an LOI or a letter of intent. You know, you shouldn't be the selected buyer and come back with that as feedback. Right. You should be right. doing, you can, you can survey that market ahead of, you know, once you've got an indication of interest before the selected vendor to say, Hey, that's going to be a problem for us. Right. Uh, yep. And so now sometimes you get cla caught flat footed. You, you maybe you did a deal a couple of years ago and the venture guys weren't interested in it. Now they're super interested in that space for whatever reason. Um, you know, it can, it can happen to you. It, it doesn't mean it, you know, it's, it's not always something you would have found in diligence. It can, you know, times can change, but you're right. It's, you know, as a smaller PE at our size, the companies we're buying, we can't afford to compete with, um, you know, the, the giant uh, money can and that some of these guys are willing to throw at a deal. Yeah. And I'll also say, this is maybe the most unsexy part of value creation, but it's super important because if we can clarify where the risks are and if we can have an open conversation about whether we're equipped to deal with them in what sequence we're going to deal with them and the things that we probably don't need to worry about, there's a lot of teams that never get to that level of clarity. And so diligence can be a great forcing function for not only unearthing those things, but getting them out on the table, not only with us as a team, but oftentimes with the founder and with the management team as we start to get closer to, you know, closing something. So risk is a big one. Now, I, I would say one thing about that, that, um, we, you know, that, that I think people misunderstand is I think people think that we, the level of diligence that you can do as a private equity firm is literally down to the, you know, the single cell. <laughs> level, yeah. Which, yeah. You know, that you're not going to get access to some things that, you know, for example, because we buy software companies, you know, you know, there's some things we can do from analyzing the code base, you know, looking for open source libraries, there, but we're not going to be able to do like a walkthrough of every module with the development team, you know, and source code reviews. This, this is not going to let you do that. For, right. For and we can't, we can't talk to every customer and we can't, you know, it's a, it's a time bound, rigorous sampling exercise. Yes. Um, very well said. It made you sound like a Stanford kid, by the way, but <laughs> we deal with it at a different time. Uh, yes. And so I think that's, that's where, you know, it's both things that are identified during diligence, but to your earlier point, we sometimes have to go to a next level when we get in there to be, you know, to, to get to the point of, yeah, we're really not super worried about that right now because yeah, as we looked at, as we got more access, cause we own the company, it's like, yeah, there was some hints there. There may be some issues, but I think we're good on the priority list. Maybe that's a three and we're going to do something else first. Yep. Amen. And that's, by the way, that's cross function. So that's one of the things I think it's important to understand is, you know, we have a relatively small company and a small portfolio and a small operating team, but even still, if you and I, you know, parachute in, you know, like the special forces and you're going to kick off a billion things at the same time, we're going to kill the organism. So, you know, some of this, you know, we start with risk, but there's also a, Hey, how much change can this company take, you know, in a unit of time? So we're not basically just burning everybody out. Yeah. And what's the one thing that we can really put our shoulder behind? Cause the man that chases two rabbits catches neither. Right. Um, Did you read that on a fortune cookie. That sounds like a fortune cookie. I think so. It's, I think it, it it's uh or did you get it from shogun are you I watching shogun? confucius i don't know i haven't seen it yet but i want to i know oh, you like it it's really good it's a really good remake yeah i can tell you that all right well i gotta i gotta watch that and roadhouse although i know the the new one's never gonna eclipse the old one when, when it comes i didn't to hate it i didn't hate it nice that's an endorsement right there yeah um, I, I i wanted to hate it because i really don't like uh Conor McGregor. Uh, I do like Jake Gyllenhaal, but I just thought, does this thing really need to be remade? But they've made enough changes <laughs> that I was, I was actually okay with it. Nice. 
Well, I hope this one is true, but you know, we are hard to get rid of uh, as investors and as the operating team. But when I think about this one, I think about the concept of psychological safety, right? Like in general, a higher performing team is the one that's going to get the issues out on the table. And oftentimes yep. we're the ones that can help catalyze that conversation in a way that especially employees who've been part of a founder owned business for a long time, either aren't structurally set up to do or just aren't emotionally comfortable with. Right. So talk about this idea of being hard to fire because I think it's an important one. Yeah. So, so look, we're, we're, you know, we're part of the Parker Gale team. You know, Parker Gale is a, a control buyer. So, you know, we own at least 51% of the companies we buy typically much more than that, but, but 51%. So, you know, we, we can, tr we can control what the company does, right? We control the board, we control the investors. So, you know, we, we can force them to do things right now. I'm not saying that's what you should do, but with that as a background, we're super hard to fire, you know, now, Obviously, if you're being just a jerk 24 seven, uh, yeah, you, they can kick you out of that portfolio company. But in general, you know, employees typically in our world where, you know, we're buying founder owned businesses, the founder is, is the, you know, godlike figure of that business. And a lot of the, the next level managers who see point up to that founder who makes all the decisions. Right. And, you know, it could be a career limiting move to bring up a very difficult topic to that founder, you know, that they don't want to tackle. Um, particularly around risk stuff or opportunities, we don't have that problem. You know, I don't care if I look stupid. I can ask. I can ask any question I want. It doesn't matter if I look dumb. And and you know, if I suggest something that's completely idiotic, you're or bring up an issue that everybody's avoiding talking about, you can't fire me. You know, like so, it's not a career limiting move for me. You know, and now you have to behave the right way. And we have a lot of trust with our with our investment teams, and we're not just running around like Chicken Little. You know. Uh, suggesting projects and, and bringing up, you know, things that we think are risky that aren't. But at the end of the day, this is a, oftentimes a real relief to, to a portfolio company employees because some of what we're asking is often stuff that they wanted to ask, but it's like, mm, I'm not going to, you know, bring this up to the founder. Totally. Again. Off the last time, right. That, you know, this is a relief valve for them that somebody else is asking the same thing they were asking. Sometimes we're bringing up something new, but it allows us to, you know, ask the dumb question. Hey, you know, so this is where the whole, have you considered raising prices, right? <laughs> yeah. That's the dumb way. Have you considered raising prices? There's the, you know, but there's also the, hey, you know, have we ever tried to raise prices? Do we think there's, you know, asking the, you know, if we sort of run this by the customers and they balked, you know, have we ever tried to push through? Do we have any, you know, have we considered adding like an automatic, you know, cost of living increase yep. in the you know, ARR contract on a yearly basis when they, you know, that can, we can ask those kind of things in that way. And, you know, sometimes like, yep, you know what, we surveyed all of our customers and this is like, they are so price sensitive, it's a disaster or, hey, we've never asked or, you know, so that's the idea of a stupid question. So it's, it's both the the goofiest private equity we consider raising prices, or, but it can also be a, a real discussion, right? You know, second item there is clearly the stuff, maybe we find a diligence, hey, we think this is broken, you know, or, you know, we think this could be a, problem in the future what, what do you think about it i mean did we miss something here right um you know killing off unprofitable products that's a, one of my personal favorites because we often see founders have some pet side projects that they do uh we could you know not for this episode we could sort of talk some of the funny ones that we've seen founders do but you know that, that's a hard decision especially if it's you know the founder loves it it's just never got any traction maybe it's an additional module maybe it's a completely new product maybe it's trying to take your existing product and push it in a new market that's yep. just not getting the attraction. And so we're able to ask the tough questions around that stuff. And, and hey, I'm, I'm just as happy if the entire management team overwhelms me with evidence that we're just wrong about something. Yeah, great. Great, you know. Um, but at least we've asked the question, right? Yeah, and that's part of the, uh, the weird flavor of thick skin that I think you have to have in this job is like you have to be willing to ask a bunch of dumb questions where – the answers either seem obvious or would be obvious if you knew a lot more about the technology or the market. Because if you're willing to do that 10 times and look stupid nine out of the 10 times, you're probably gonna stumble on something pretty valuable. That again, more more often than not, the, the business has already thought of, they just haven't gotten to yet. But you have to be willing to ask that stupid question, bring up the uncomfortable topic, you know, suggest the less traveled path, and to do it again and again and again uh, and know that, hey, 
it's not going to be uh, like the phrase career limiting move. Um, I've certainly made some of those in my past, but yeah. Well, yeah, and sometimes, more by the way, here. they may already have tried that thing and it didn't totally. work. Totally. It had nothing to do with the thing. You know, we've had situations where we've had portfolio company A did something and it worked. B tried the same thing and it didn't work. Sometimes the B, the, you know, the second company just picked the wrong vendor to work with. It didn't do it the right way or whatever. So sometimes a cross-pollination between portfolio companies also leads to great, like, hey, this is, we had the same problem, but we were able to make it work by doing this, right? So, yeah. I mean, for us, you and I love the, you know, the margin call line with, you know, uh, Jeremy Irons, where he's, you know, explain it to me as you would a small child or a golden retriever. It wasn't brains <laughs> got me here. Can I show you of that? You know, that yep. I think you know, saying it the right way, you know, not coming in there like, hey, guy, you know, is the best way to say or ask something stupid without making the team go bananas. And I've been in situations, by the way, where I ask the stupid thing or suggest something super stupid. And they're all such chippy chatting amongst themselves and come up with a way better idea than I came up with. Totally. And a better idea than they'd come up with before. Just the, the dumb thing I said or the question I asked spurred them to like, yeah, that was dumb. But you know what? That was interesting that maybe we should do this instead. And I again, agree. That's us, yeah. Do you have a favorite one of these? Because I, I might have a favorite one of mine that could give you some time to, to think ahead, about yeah, it. Yeah, where, yeah. yeah. so. Yeah. There was a portfolio company of ours, I think it was a second or third board meeting that we were sitting in and we were having a conversation around sales pipeline and the budget and how we were going to meet the number as the numbers ramped up later in the year. And the the team had done some good work to break out the assumptions in the budget between new logo and upsell sales, right? So kind of drawing a line in the sand and saying, this is what we think is going to come from new logo. This is what we're going to come from upsell. And when you compared those numbers against what was in the pipeline, it was pretty clear that we were having an easier time selling to our existing customer base. And the new logo side of things, as it often is, is a little bit harder to get going, especially if it's more of a cold start. And I saw this moment in the board meeting where I kind of just said, screw it, I'm going to ask the question, uh, you know, guys, have you considered that we could hit our number if we only focused on our existing customer base. I'm not saying we should neglect the new logo thing. I'm not saying we should stop prospecting and next thing we should cut our marketing budget. But if we were going to focus on one place, it seems pretty clear that it should be the existing customer base. Is that mathematically true? And it was kind of an odd question, but it led to about an hour discussion about how much white space there was in the customer base how little we had done to that point to ask them how else we could help. And we got to a pretty important level of agreement that kind of set the tone for the year for the company about like, yeah, it's all about the existing customer base. So I'm not taking credit for that. I'm just giving an example of asking the very elementary, almost stupid question about, hey, it seems like this is what's going on. And it wasn't the question so much where the value was created. But it was the conversation that followed it that led to this level of commitment on something that ended up being like a super important driver of performance in the business. And so I, I always come back to that. And it's always a good reminder for me to like look for the growth in the customer base, but also don't be afraid to ask the stupid question, even if it's uh, in the semi-intimidating setting of a board meeting. So I don't know. That's my favorite one. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, almost a 180 degrees from how you did it. So this is more of an implementation issue. Yeah. Yeah. We don't, we've had a number of portfolio companies historically, cause we've been part of a number of funds over the years in the education space. Um, and we had to build a mobile application and they were using a team to keep doing mock-ups of the mobile application. And the teachers were heavily involved and they would be the ones using this application. And they literally got to a point where just nobody could agree on the design. And, you know, I mean, the teachers are generally, I would argue are probably more creative than your average you know, employee at an average firm, just by nature of the, the job, they have to be, right? And so I came up with this really dumb idea that I had giant iPhone panels made on a floor. We cleaned out a room on a floor and I had boxes of UI elements that we created the same way. And we got a bunch of the teachers together and we let them just lay the things out on these, Love <laughs> these that. panels on the floor. Yeah. And they all, we sat back, literally, we brought coffee and sandwiches and stuff in and the head engineering guy and I just sat back and just watched them work. And after four hours, they came up with a design they loved and they were completely invested in it. We just took pictures of it and we took that back to the firm, mocked it up 
and you know, Bob's your uncle. We eventually you know, moved the thing on, but it was just. I, and I remember the engineering team's like, "You want to do what?" Yeah, <laughs> the, if you if you get an eye roll, you know you've uh, you've done a hard to fire thing. But right, yeah, so it was literally yeah. like a bunch of puzzle pieces, you know, old color forms. You know, you put the you know the pieces in place, and, it, and literally that was a, a good way to do it. And so again, that's you know, that's not, it was. It was a weird idea and it may not have worked, but in that particular case, we kind of been down a couple paths over time and just really felt we were sort of hitting a wall that we just couldn't get through. And so I could suggest we do something dumb and everybody sort of thought it was dumb until they started doing it and then they had a really good time doing it. Yeah, and when in doubt, make it a workshop is not a bad uh, rule of thumb for some of this stuff. Well, that so, could be a good title of your business book when you retire. There you go. <laughs> a lot of good titles. You've got a lot of good like titles. I've got, I've got a couple of those to pick from at this point. So. <laughs> We are hard to fire. That's both good for our uh, our morale, but I think it's also good for getting the the issues out on the table. Yeah. Um, so so far we've done that. We're doing the Monty Python. You know, uh, you know, we have three main weapons: fear, surprise, and almost fanatic emotion. <laughs> uh, you know, the first thing is risk mitigation that we focus on. The second thing is, you know, we're we're hard to fire, right? Yeah. So we can ask the dumb things, we can make suggestions, we can poke into issues that were probably problematic before. And, you know, we get, we get, we get the ability to do that if we're, if we're, if we behave the right way and we communicate the right way, whereas employees may not. Yep. Which brings us to three. I'm going to let you start with this one because you are. Uh, yeah. I think this is four because number one was the menu. I guess the one was the menu. Yeah. yeah. We build yeah. the menu. Don't forget about the cheesecake factory. Risk, hard to fire. Rhythm might be my most treasured one, as no. as, as you no. probably know. That's, that's a shock, Paul. I think yeah. this is like the the most underused tool in business is thinking about your your operating rhythm. But it, like the the cheesecake factory menu of things that we do matters. But like the sequencing and the model that you put them in and the rhythm that it gets the team into, I think is way more important. And this is all about building momentum, right? Where the things that you do and the rituals that you have every week, every month, every quarter or so, if you, if you set those up really thoughtfully and you do it in a way where it doesn't feel interventionist, it just feels like something you do. Like Jim, you talk about, hey, it's like doing push-ups, right? You just do it every day. You don't think about it. You get in a groove, and before you know it, you know things are a little different. Um, before you know it, I could do five. <laughs> before you know it, my, both my shoulders need surgery, which which they've had. Um, but yeah, when we think about the operating rhythm, this is the way that we talk about it. We talk about what we do weekly, what we do monthly, and what we do quarterly. And there's this quote that I love. Um, I think it's Ryan Holiday. I can't remember, but it's. Uh, a lack of self-awareness is poison and the antidote is reflection and review. So in every buddy Holly, was it? No, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll believe whatever you say. Cause you're the, you're the quote guy, but for, for each of these, like what we're trying to do is create the container inside of which like natural moments of reflection and natural moments of review and just watching the game tape happens, right? So if anybody out there has read our weekly sales metrics playbook, I talk a lot about our approach to go to market reporting. Uh, there's a reason it's called less data more often because it happens every week and it's a very palatable amount of metrics and reporting. And when we pair that with a conversation every week, which sometimes is just, how's it going? How was your vacation? You know, great quarter. Uh, and sometimes it's, Hey, we got an important project coming up. Are you ready to present this? Are you ready to unveil this? Are we ready to launch the marketing campaign? Whatever it is. But when we can have some touch point within our respective areas of the company, I think every week, um, you just feel like you're in the know a little bit more and it puts us in a position to be more helpful if, and when the time comes. And then every month it's a little bit more of a deeper dive, um, both on the finances and on the commercial side. And if we do it right, Jim, tell me if you agree, like the board meeting, there's not that much you have to get ready in terms of new material for the board meeting. Cause we think templates build trust and the templates that we use for our weekly and monthly touch points and the rhythm that those create, like the board meeting is just another opportunity to pull up, review those things, have a conversation and a really good board meeting. You can kind of elevate out of those 
normal templates, normal reports, and just talk about the big rocks that you've noticed as a result of looking at those things every week and every month. But this is one thing, it's actually something I talk with CEOs quite a bit about in the diligence process of just how do you run your team? Like, what do you guys do every week? What do you do every month? What do you do every quarter? Because chances are some of that's not going to change when we get involved as investors. Um, but we can bring examples, we can bring templates, we can bring earned secrets from other companies who've told us like, hey, for example, the most helpful thing that you did for us would just make us look at the data every week, uh, which is actually feedback that we've sure. gotten. So yeah, the rhythm thing matters. This is one of my most favorite concepts and parts of the job. And we think a lot about what does a week look like? What does a month look like? What does a quarter look like in the life of every single one of our companies? Yeah, I would say, so th there's a few things, I, again, we, I would also put in this, where we have quarterly-ish. There are also some things, by the way, that we found. Um, things like board meetings are definitely, you know, quarterly, unless we're in some kind of crisis mode where we're doing monthly board meetings. Things like, in our world, product strategy reviews, like, all right, what did we, what did we build in the last quarter? You know, the, were we on time, on target? Are we, you know, what are we building for the next uh, you know, the next 12 to 18 months or what's coming up in the next quarter and, and some additional rhythm of things that are important to our companies. For example, you know, with software companies, oftentimes you build the software, but you forget, do we have the demos? Uh, so we got a yep. new model, do we have a demo and do we have the sales deck that can explain this and do the feature benefit is, is support been trained? You know, yep. do we have, you know, the, you know, have we planned like a webinar to talk about it? So there, these are the kind of things that sometimes didn't get thought about, um, but, but are really important. So I, you know, there's a rhythm, but there's also the, what I would call these one-off rhythms where you may have a project you're trying to do that you're getting it again, the rhythm on the, um, uh, yeah, that I think is important. Yeah. So, and this is one of those things that, yeah, it's part of the value creation playbook, but if you're out there either running a company or running a part of a company, uh, I think it's a, it's a great self-reflective question of just how are you using your calendar? Yes. What is your operational rhythm? What are the most important times that you and your team get together and why are you doing that? And how can you reflect on like, okay, what does that look like at its best and at its worst? And what can you change as a result of that? Because this is, uh, can fly under the radar and I think it's super powerful. Yeah. Now one, one more thing I would say about that though, you know, that I think is important, um, is you don't have to have this detailed list of crazy metrics, whatever the, you know, less data more often, but yep. if we're asking for it and we're not reading it, you know, then shame on us and, and that you're just wasting the time. Total shame on us. So yeah, the things we're asking people to report on should be things that we that they and us can use to manage the business. And you know, just doing crazy metrics, just have crazy metrics is not something that we're trying to do here, right? So this is, a, it depends, less is more. And to your point, in a rhythm, like, hey, we're going to talk about this issue on a, and, you know, and that was, by the way, one of the things yeah, I'll just give you a, a funny anecdote with one of our portfolio companies some years ago in the product strategy reviews. Part of the reason we really started doing this on a quarterly basis, engineering had a, you know, had a product at the beginning of the year, they had sort of on a loose roadmap that was going, going to be ready for production December 1st. And yep. sales had some crazy $4 million target for that year for that product. In and, Q4. You know, yep. In Q4. My, my yep. simple question was, hey, God, like, I'm not exactly <laughs> sure. Yeah, we don't have any marketing materials. We don't have any demos. Like, okay, we're going to blow this thing dry on December 1st and you yep. sell, sell $4 million of a product that was like a 50K product. I'm like, guys, I think there's a disconnect here. Uh, and, you know, again, that's not, there's, there's no fault of anybody doing it. You know, I just think people weren't thinking through like, yeah, you're probably right. Like, yeah, it's not going to be yeah. ready for a year, so let's not try and put it on the pipeline, right? Yeah, um, there's a lot of stuff going on, and that's, I mean, that's a great question to ask. It's like, okay, does that work with the assumptions either in the budget or for the business in general? The The reporting point is a, is a great one. It's like, hey, are, is anybody even looking at this? And that's right. not an indictment. It's just an opportunity to streamline things. Um, and I think you're exactly right. Like, I think one of the reasons private equity gets a bad name is they ask for more metrics than the business has ever produced before, and they give no indication of why they're important or how they're interpreting them. And I'm a big believer that data is only as good as a conversation that it creates. 
And I feel pretty good about the fact that every piece of data that we ask for, there's a conversation that happens as a result of it, not just from us, the investors, but usually with the management team as well. Yeah. Well, and, and what and how, how people get into a mess with this is, again, this is not a, an indictment of associates at private equity firms, but you stick an associate on, particularly around sales reporting. Yep. You have some complex spreadsheet that they're supposed to fill out and the associates, you know, they're getting the, you know, they're getting beaten down by the deal partner who's telling, where's this metric sheet? And they're beating up the company. Give me the part thing. The I need the thing. Yeah, part, part of the problem, like, you know, hey, any of our associates that, you know, work with us at Parker Yale know more about a deal structure, you know, than you and I in cap tables and, you know, and uh, quality of earnings than you and I will ever know. But they're not equipped to be able to make in the moment decisions about about what metrics we need or, or don't need on the business, right? And that's, that's yep. part of the reason why using senior operating people with this with these rhythm items, we're going to be better equipped to say, hey, these are the five things we care about on weekly reporting. Like, let's not get crazy here because we know that those are going to be good indicators that we can take action on, you know, and steer the ship as opposed to just let's get every metric possible and you know, and whip the CFO to get this to us on a weekly basis to go into the deal partner's inbox that they're not reading. Totally. It, it, like you could borrow a term from the pharmaceutical industry on this one, minimum effective dose, right? You're looking for the amount of medicine that does the good without doing too much. And I, would, I thought you were going to go in a completely different direction. I thought you were going to go, you know, uh, if you're taking private equity, <laughs> you're in a long list of symptoms. Side effects may include operating partners <laughs> sitting in your office. Yeah. That's a whole uh, other, uh, that's worth another kind of video with uh, people but, but, dancing. And I think the, the last long point, which you're very good at and I'm not as good at, uh, is rhythm is, is important. You know, let's stick to it. I mean, we've been in plenty of situations where staying in the rhythm is, we end up with a five minute call. Totally. And, yeah. And that's fine. You know, it's literally fine. It's that's, that's okay. It's you, you don't need to fill the time, but if, if you get out of that habit, then what happens is things start, you know, the wheels start coming off and you are just out of the habit of getting on the phone and then it becomes a crisis. Yeah. And, and the relationship gets stale too, right? Like I think more than 0% of the benefit here is, when you do a weekly call with someone, when you do a monthly conversation about how things are going, you just get closer and you start to trust each other more so that when something really important or really problematic comes up, it's way easier to talk about it. It's way easier to debate the issue without turning it into a personal attack. And you can just like go there much yes. easier. Right. And I, I think that's an important part of just, just well, like push ups, just keep doing it. And it also gets us to, to what we want in the board meetings. You know, as an example, you know, I've seen plenty of situations. I'm just giving you, I'm, 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 I'm melanging a few examples together to one. But Please you know, do. You'll have a situation where, you know, for example, uh, we've seen this. I saw this a lot in portfolio companies where we're, we were doing mobile development. Mobile became a thing, right? And the teams would lay out, you know, hey, it'll probably take us a year with our existing engineering team and some training to build the first version of the mobile app. We've talked to a number of our customers and there's an appetite for it. Like they'd pay for it a little more or whatever. And if you're doing it right, that allows us to, to elevate the board discussion and, and involve us where we can help, which is, hey, you don't have the money for the mobile thing, but it looks like that'd be a really big seller. We could throw a million bucks on the balance sheet so you could, yep. you know, so you could get the thing done in the first quarter. And I'm not saying throwing money at a problem is always, but we, you know, that becomes a collaborative conversation where we can make some strategic choices with you that you may not think you can make on your own, right? What a good segue uh, to the so next way for kids, you know? <laughs> that we create value. Because this is something that I think you're great at, Jim, is we do create value by translating for the board. And that's, I mean, that's a good example is just, kind of elevating an issue that people just cast aside as we can't do it because there's a capital constraint or a priority constraint or some reason that it doesn't make sense to bring up. But you can diagnose like, hey, that actually seems like it's worth talking about and elevate that to at yep. least drive it to clarity or closure. But but talk about like, when you say you translate things for the board, what does that mean? Well, so I always give a stupid example of, you know, you'll have a founder who trades in their Mercedes every year but, you know, is beating up engineering that they want to, you know, change out a 10 year old Dell server, you know, um, you know, so, you know, part of this, Hey, I bought that server. It should last forever. You know, um, but you trade it in your car every year, but 
Yeah, for a second. You know, hey, hardware has an expected life. You're going to have some outages. I mean, our job is to translate from the, the staff and management people, you know, management level people that may be highly focused on their job and don't know how to translate the technical details or the or the the minutia into something that a board member can swallow, right? The board doesn't have the benefit of being in the business every day. We have more of a benefit. We're in the business more than the than the board, but you know, less than the management teams, but we know how, we know what the board is looking for, right? They're looking for, Hey, I'm going to help you with strategy here. I'm going to help you make decisions, you know, uh, but I need a certain amount of information and it needs to be sort of summarized. I can't have the minutia of the details. Right. And yep. so, you know, our job is to translate that into, you know, oftentimes it's translating thing, things like risk into what's the likelihood and, you know, is it worth us spending our effort on? But but it can be anything. It can be a new product. It can be a new market. It can be a strategy. And our job is to translate it from the minutia you know, that the that the uh, the staff members need to make the decision and to do the work into something that the board can understand in five ten minutes and make a strategic decision on. And yeah, that that can be difficult, right? And a lot of it's just framing, right? It's the same issue. Yeah. It's the same details. It's the same. Um, ingredients to the conversation, but it's how you put it on the plate, right? So instead of laying out everything that's going on, I think one of the things that we try to do in board meetings is just elevate the most important problem so it doesn't become this show and tell. It's like, no, we, let's talk about the stuff that matters. Let's talk about the stuff that we're excited about. Let's talk about stuff that we're worried about and frame those things as what is the actual challenge? Is the challenge we don't know what to do? Is the challenge we don't have the people to address it? Is the challenge that there's a competitor moving into our zip code. We got to figure out how to respond. Like, what is the challenge? Just articulating the challenge and diagnosing what's going on. There's value in that. And there's value in laying out what your options are. So you can say, hey, we should do this instead of that. And then, yeah, planning is important. I think planning is important both for reasons of commitment as reasons of project management, right? If you put a plan down and say, hey, guys, this is what we're going to do. Um, it's a lot harder to just kind of nod your head because typically there's names and dates against that plan. So it's a mechanism for getting people to commit to what happens next. Uh, and then, yeah, it makes it easier to track and report out on and make sure that we're making progress. But when you have a board meeting that's more about, hey, surfacing the issues, laying out the options, committing to those choices that you're gonna make, and then figuring out what you're gonna do next. One, those are way more fun. Uh, and way more interesting, especially if you're sitting there for four or five hours. Um, but two, you come back in three months and wouldn't you know it, stuff got done. Yeah. I think I think this is also highly related to, you know, we can't be fired, right? Because we, we also do, when we surface some of these issues to the board, right? Yeah. We often see, hey, the business made the right decision that they didn't focus on this because in the list of things they were worried about, it was pretty far down on the list, but it's become higher by the time we got involved, right? Yep. And the last thing an employee wants to do is, you know, make that presentation to the board and everybody in the room is looking at it like, it's your fault that we never got here. I can raise that issue and say, hey guys, I know we we weren't really worried about this, but here's why I'm worried about it now. That, yep. you know, we're probably, you know, running into a, a situation where this has become a higher priority. Um, I know you guys have lived with it for a while, but I'm feeling like this could really bite us in the tail if, we're, if we don't deal with it, right? And yeah, you know, that's protecting the employees from, it's not their fault, it's, hey, it's Jim saying that he's worried about this and and, I, and I'll fight the battle of why I think I'm worried about it. And you know, again, that's very helpful for the board. They don't have to get down into the minutia and they don't have to understand every single detail, but it also protects the team from, you know, hey guys, this is not, we're not assigning blame here, you know? Uh, great line from Rising Sun, you know, fix the problem, not the blame. Yep. Uh, I see. Is that from? No, I think it's from the other Michael Crichton, uh, Disclosure. Fix the problem, not the blame is Disclosure. I always mix up my uh, Michael Crichton film adaptations too. Um, yeah, I think one way you could reframe this is like we help the board calibrate their spidey senses, right? So what are the things that we should be worried about? What are the things that we can kind of wait and see on? Um because sometimes that can be tough to know, especially if you're not talking to the company every single week. I love this slide, and I'm sorry if you're listening on the podcast and you can't see it, but this is a nudge to check us out on YouTube if you're just listening to the audio experience because this is something we're very focused on right now after having a couple of exits in the last few years. But 
how do we create value? We get ready for the exit, which is a big part of being part of a private equity backed company. And it's an intense part of being part of a private equity backed company because you get asked a lot of questions and it reveals what you've prepared for, what you've done in the background and what you haven't. So the story, so, yeah. So, so let's just take at the, at the first level, just, just so people understand, you know, kind of what we're talking about, right? Cause let's not kid ourselves. You know, any investor buys a company to eventually sell it, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They, I mean, there was an era of you bought stocks because they had really good dividends and you just held the stock and, you know, you, you got, you know, uh, you get this distributions all year long, well, whatever. When you're talking about private companies, either venture back or private, private equity, you're buying it to at some point sell it. And the assumption is it's getting bigger as you are selling, you know, from when you buy it to when you sell it. Not always. There are some cases where there are companies that are really no growers, but it's a cash flow kind of business and it's a, a sort of a financing vehicle. Again, that's okay. I'm not arguing with that as a model, but in general, and in particular for us, you know, we're buying sub $20 million revenue companies. And at some point, you know, when they're in the 40, 50 million revenue, we're selling them to somebody else. And the somebody else is going to be bigger, whether it's, you know, to a large strategic, to a a, a larger private equity firm taking them public, uh, which is rare for us, but but possible. The level of rigor that's required by the next owners is going to be much higher than when we bought it. And yes, that's, that's what we mean by getting ready for the exit. There are going to be some things that need to be in place that you didn't have to have when you were a smaller company. Yeah. And I, I think we knew for a long time in general, like we've seen a lot of these, right? We've been through a lot of exit processes. We've done a lot of diligence uh, ourselves on companies that we've thought about buying and companies we've actually bought. And so we had a pretty general view of like, yeah, this is the stuff you ask about in diligence, but we'd never written down a checklist of, hey, portfolio company, this is what you should be ready for when this upcoming diligence process happens, whether it's planned or unplanned. So this was one of my favorite parts of last year. I grabbed a few members of our investment team, uh, a few members of you know the operating team, and we literally printed out the last five diligence decks that we had gotten from other private equity funds that had evaluated our companies. So folks that had requested data, analyzed the data, put questions on the slides, this is what we wanna know. And we got a bunch of espresso and we flipped through all the different decks and we used post-it notes and wrote down, what are they asking for? What do we have to have ready? What is the thing that we need to prepare for that's going to be asked about in diligence? And we got to the end of the decks and then we clustered all these on a whiteboard and we created themes. And the interesting thing about this think like a buyer session, which is what we called it, uh, was a lot of it related to the data that the company, at least in theory, should be gathering every day. So data around what their pipeline looked like, data around their customers, data around the products they were selling, data around margin, data around what engineering was doing and where they were spending time. And just putting that into one place where it was easy to query later on. So Caroline and our team did an amazing job of, of summarizing this uh, and kind of drawing the Venn diagram that you see at the top of this page of not only what are you going to need during the diligence process, but what should you be doing now that's going to help you run the business better and help you stay ready so you don't have to get ready when that diligence process inevitably comes up. So we'll do a, a future episode on uh, some of the kind of specific findings from that think like a buyer session. But the point is we built this punch list by reverse engineering what we know other private equity investors and strategic acquirers are going to ask us in the future. And we've put it into a format that's really easy to understand, that's really easy to evaluate as we go through year one, year two, year three of the investment. And that we can update over time because as you get into different areas of the macroeconomic cycle, investors care about different things. Uh, and I'm sure that you know, all we know is that the list is a little bit wrong because it's going to change as time goes along. Yeah. So a fun, I'll give you a funny, um, it's sort of a metaphor here that, uh, yeah, I'm old enough that, uh, I, uh, I was writing term papers in college when there, there wasn't a personal desktop computer. We literally were working on a VAX and you literally compiled, you typed in formatting commands in the document and compiled it. Oh yeah. 
quality printer, right? But th that's not the relevant part of the story. The relevant part of the story is because I had that language and toolkit available to me, kids were still typing papers, right? So, and I remember, so I, won't, I will not point out this person, but he was, I, you know, uh, I think he was the valedictorian of my class, really smart guy, right? Um, wrote a much better paper, but trying to get the footnotes right and the index and table of context and, you know, appendix and all that stuff was really hard when you're typing it because every time you make a change, you're whiting out whatever. So his wasn't great. Mine was easy because I just literally edited it and, the, and reprinted, you know, recompiled and printed. So I had an okay paper, but unbelievable table of contents, footnote, <laughs> couple page, and you know, it, it was it was awesome, right? And yeah, on, you, the professor looking at it, it, I think I got you know at least probably a one letter, one better letter grade. I got it from a B to an A on this dumb paper because yep. it was just I just had all the pieces, all the things that were necessary. Yep, and that's part of what we're we're talking about here. Is some of this stuff is just simply not. Rocket science, for example, uh, I'll, I'll give you an engineering example. If you use contractors to write any part of your software, you need a release that, you know, you have the rights to that code. It's not their rights. It was a work for hire, right? And, you know, oftentimes going into a deal, we find we, we yeah, that's something we can't close around. And we generally, the poor founders are chasing somebody who wrote something for them three years ago that they got to get a release from this person, right? And that's the kind of stuff that, wow, if you have all that stuff, when you're selling the company, Man, the, the buyer gets overwhelmed by like, wow, these guys are really buttoned up. And, you know, it's, it makes it when you get to sticky items and there will be sticking items in every sale. Yes. It's, it's really not a death of a thousand cuts. It's only one or two things you need to talk about as opposed to you got so many of these things that were sort of half baked when you handed it to them. And it, to your point, it's easier to get in the rhythm of doing it. You know, it's the clean your room a little every day so you don't have to do the massive, you know, spring cleaning, you know, once a month kind of thing, right? It's yes. way faster to do it that way, right? Yeah. So this idea of being exit ready and thinking like a buyer is a big kick that we're on right now. And it is, it's a sneaky form of value creation um, because you know that pop quiz is coming up. And if you study a little bit every day, it's a lot easier to get a good grade on it. So yeah, this is, um, you know, glad you tuned in. I'm not sure what the folks out there listening to the podcast, watching the video expected on that first slide where we talked about value creation. But, you know, we are in an era where just financially engineering your way to an exit is harder. And in an era like this, having a philosophy and an approach to value creation is more important. And, and we don't think this is about having all the answers ahead of time. And having that one immutable, concrete, unchanging value creation playbook and just doing the same thing every single time is the way to do it. Uh, it is about that idea of it depends. And it's about creating the menu and then doing all the other things that we talked about. Mitigating the risk, being hard to fire. It's about rhythm. It's about translating for the board. And it's about being exit ready. And we're always working on how we communicate the importance of those things, the tools and templates and resources we have in the back to help people get better at each of these things and talking about it as a team. Um, and, you know, getting the chance to build out a unique perspective on this is a fun part of working at Parker Gale and we're trying to get better at it uh, every single day, but it's an important topic. It's a misunderstood topic. And Jim, it's a fun topic to talk about with you. So appreciate yeah. it. You know, I, I do think, um, you know, I, I don't want to diss the, you know, the concept of playbooks, you know, because there are some private equity guys that are buying, you know, they're doing $2 billion deals. And there's some things that can be, you know, playbooked yes. at that scale. So look at all the, you know, company insurance and what you're spending time on. Look at all the software licenses. Those can add up to real dollars at larger companies. Um, I, you know, I cannot believe I'm going to say this because I do not like the person. Oh, I can't all. wait. Um, it, it'll be a shocker. You know, I mean, what you know, what Elon Musk has done to Twitter is is, and I refuse to call it X, is an abomination, right? But yeah, you know, what he cut two thirds of the staff, and everybody felt like the thing would just be disappear. It couldn't, it wouldn't stay up anymore. And I'm, I, I think everything he did was wrong. But the the point of that was nobody, believed, including me, believed you could cut that much staff out of Twitter and the thing wouldn't just come crashing into the sea. It would yep. be down. It would be fail whaling all the time. It was wrong, right? It's these large companies. There are some playbookish things you can do. 
I will just tell you what the low, our experience at the lower end of the market is it, it just it just simply isn't you know like the 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 hey I can always you know run these plays at every portfolio company they just they just don't it's not a bang for the buck it, it it is it depends and I would I would make the argument there are a lot more of the sub one hundred million dollar companies where you can't really have a playbook than there are the you know two billion dollar guys that you can buy and again I'm not dissing any of those business models or anyhow they do it just for us it wouldn't work. No, I agree. So we're going to be doing more of these. We're committing to do more video, more workshoppy type content. We hope you liked it. If you like it, we would love to hear about it. So that can be as simple as subscribing to us here on YouTube or to the Private Equity Fundcast. We're 300 episodes in and not stopping anytime soon. Uh, that's on Apple. That's on Spotify. That's on anywhere that you get your podcast. Reach out and tell us what you think. So ops at parkergale.com. We will both get an email if you send something uh, to that email address. We'd love to hear from you. And then Jim and I write and rant about this stuff quite often on both LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> here, Paul. You write. I mostly. <laughs> let's just not. Yeah. Let's just not make this. You know, insane here. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to get an email from you, and we'd love to see you uh, checking out the stuff that we're putting out there. Yeah, so we're and I think we're trying to find we're trying to dual dual post these so you know all these episodes will be both a podcast for audio but that you know I think slides are, are somewhat useful um, in some of the things that we're doing certainly some of the ones we've got coming up are more complex and it's 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 important to see a graphic um, so you know look look for both even if you just listen to the podcast it might be useful for you to flip to the video if you have questions so totally and then a quick advertisement here at the end I mean part of the fun of this job is just meeting people right and if you own a software company or you run a software company we want to meet you too uh and here are some of the folks and some of the qualities that we're especially interested in the left hand side of the page it's all about what we typically invest in and the right hand side of the page are the the typical profiles of folks that either end up working on a thesis or a, a new investment with us or end up as part of our management team in the portfolio but if you look at this page and you say yeah that's me Reach out, let us know. We'd love to spend some time with you and love to tell you more about what it is that we do. Yeah, and I would tell you that, you know, we've we've talked to, to execs sometimes five years before we ended up doing a deal together. They've done yep. something else in the back to it. So this is not, you know, nothing has to be super urgent. We we love to have the conversations. Um, and we're constantly working on internally on I'm not going to say the word because I can't stand the way it sounds. Hypothesis is what it means. We work on hypothesis, <laughs> areas that we're interested in, and do some research on, hey, we think there's some, something interesting there we might want to invest in. And we're constantly running those plays. And again, those are okay that we do some work. It's like, yeah, not for us, or can't see how we can make money in that market, or too crowded, or bigger guys are better than us in that, that space. Again, that's okay. Um, but we're, we're always happy to, to also listen to a pitch about some market you think is interesting. Yeah, we just like learning about this stuff, right? So even if you're never interested in selling your business or even if you got the best job you've ever gotten and you're not going anywhere, we'd love to meet you anyway. So, Jim, this was fun. How can they have the best job they've ever gotten? They're not working for a Parker Gale portfolio company. Well, that's... By, well, by your it's, very definition, that's just wrong. Yeah, you're giving away my pitch, man. Well, there you go. Uh, cool. All right, well, we'll close it out here. Uh, ciao for now. Ciao for now.